there are words that are going to end in the word O-R and words that end in the word E-E. Think of the words that end in O-R as the one doing the action. And the one that it's done to is the E-E. So let me show you. In the trust, the person that deeds the property into this trust, which is a document, it is an artificial person. It is a, well, it's not a human being, but it's seen as a legal person. The person that deeds the property into it is called the trust or. He's the one de doing the action. He deeded the property into a trust. That trust is ran by or guided by a person because let's face it, that document can't walk and talk and do stuff. So it has to have a person to physically do actions for it. That person is called, and I'm sure you've heard of this, the trust T. There's the one it's done to. So the person guiding the trust is the trustee. So we have a trust that is created by a trustor. And in that trust, he would name a trustee to actually do the action. The actual trust is a big legal document that would have every scenario that could potentially ever happen. And the trustee is the one that just does what it says to do. Now, in that trust, they are going to name a beneficiary who receives the benefits of whatever that trust is doing. Now, I am sure you guys have heard of these things called trust fund babies. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Conrad Hilton from the Hilton Hotels made a trust and put a bunch of money in it. In that particular example, Conrad Hilton would be the trustor and he named a money manager or an attorney firm or somebody to guide the trust. That person would be the trustee. And then he named his two granddaughters, Nikki Hilton and Paris Hilton, as the beneficiaries of the trust. And the trust has a statement that says something to the order of, on the anniversary of their birth, <laughs> birthday, please write them a check for a million dollars out of the trust. They are the ones benefiting from the trust. They are called the beneficiary. So the trustee, who's the one that walks and talks and acts and does everything, reads that line in the trust and goes, oh, okay, I'll write a check. Here's one for you, and here's one for you. That is the premise behind how a trust works. Now, we can put land in a trust. It's called a land trust. You actually can put anything in a trust. You can put personal property, like cars. You can put money, like I just explained. You can put land in a trust. It's called a land trust. It used to be called an Illinois land trust because they were the first state that kind of recognized it. All right? So that is the third way. When that trust is created, it is either created when the trustor is a lie, alive, so it is called a living trust. When that trustor who makes the trust just goes down to his attorney today and goes, hey, I want to make a trust. That would be a living trust. If the person 
dies and his will creates the trust after he's dead, it is called a testamentary trust. Now, the word testate here is a legal term that means with a will. So if a person dies testate, that means they have a will. That's where the word testamentary comes from, all right? Because it's the will that created the trust for the beneficiary and not while that trustor was alive. Do not confuse this with a living will. That's a medical document that talks about DNR. And I don't mean the Department of uh, Natural Resources, all right? So don't confuse a living trust with a living will. Two different documents. In a land trust, the land is the only asset that's in it. It's only land that they put in that land trust. Now, the advantages to trusts are that when they get recorded, typically in the public records, the trustee is not named. So it can be used as a secrecy kind of thing so that nobody really knows who's benefiting from the property or benefiting from the asset in any case. Cool? So that is the third way to own property. There are people that could have beneficial interests. They can assign those a beneficial interest to another party if they choose. So in that example I was talking about, let's say Paris Hilton wanted her best friend to get money. She could assign this year's or her beneficial interest of the trust to another person and that person would now get become the beneficiary of that trust. All right? Are we good? Do you need to take a break? <clears throat> Hit the pause, go get a cup of coffee, take a break. There are some business organizations that I want to talk about that could own property as well. The first one is a partnership. A partnership is two or more entities or people carrying on business to procure a profit in some sort of business arrangement or some business field. In that partnership, there are two types. There is a general partner. A general partner is when a partner that participates in the daily activities of the partnership. They are the ones that run the company, so to speak. That is the upside in this, is that they get to run or participate in the uh, upside. The downside is that they share full liability in anything that happens within the company. All right, so this is kind of a visual joke. So the, the upside is they get to make the decisions. Hey, I want to paint the building blue. The building gets painted blue. The downside to this is, let's say they get sued for $20 million for something that happened. They are on the hook for that $20 million. They take full responsibility as the general partner. The second partner that's involved in this, that's not what I really wanted, I really wanted this arrow here, is a person called a limited partner. A limited partner is, has upsides and downsides. In the limited partnership, the downside, let's draw a down arrow, is they do not get to participate in the daily activities of the business. They cannot participate. They can't make decisions. They are kind of along for the ride. So in the general partner, remember I told you, his upside is 
hey, I want to paint the building blue. He makes the decisions. The building gets painted blue. The limited partner cannot participate. He wanted to paint it green, but who cares? He cannot participate. So that's his downside. So why would someone do that? Well, there is an upside. Let's draw an up arrow right there. Remember I told you in a general partner, they get sued for $20 million. They are fully on the hook for it. In a limited partner, and this is where the term comes from, they actually are limited to the exposure to the amount they participated in the deal. Let me say that again. They did, the general partner made a decision. It went wrong. They got sued for $20 billion. Their downside is they're fully liable. Here's the visual joke. <laughs> The limited partner that put $200,000 into this deal cannot participate in the daily activities. That is the rule. But when they got sued for $20 billion, his upside is he's limited in his exposure to the $200,000 he put into it because he is, in fact, a limited partner. Hey, it wasn't my decision to do that. I couldn't make the decision. Therefore, I am kind of protected. Therefore, they are limited. All right. And you can have general and limited partners in one deal. Everybody could be a general partner. All four guys in the construction company could be a general partner. You could have four general partners and two limited partners any way you guys want to put them together, all right? The next entity is a corporation. A corporation, by definition, is an artificial person. They can do anything a person can do except vote, unless they're in Chicago. No, <laughs> that was humorous. So corporations are formed and they actually can live forever unless they are administratively dissolved. Now, even though they are managed by a CEO or a board of directors or shareholders, all right, they are seen as one entity, one entity. And when the corporation goes out and buys a property in their corporate name, even though they are quote unquote guided by thousands of people with shareholders and board of directors and presidents and CEO, the fact they took it in the corporate name, which is an artificial person, means they took ownership, how? In severalty. Because it's one person. That one person, think about, uh, it's like schizophrenic. That one person's being told what to do by many, many people. Kind of like, you know, that theory of voices in your head. That one person, i.e. Pepsi, Cola, Inc., bottling, or whatever it's called, is one person, it would buy a bottling plant in severalty, even though it's ran by a bunch of people. The third one is the new boy on the block. And I say that it's 80s in the 1980s, so it's going on 40 years old now, is this thing called a limited liability company, an LLC. The LLC is kind of like the best of both worlds, all right? Because it combines the taxation feature of a partnership and the protections of a corporation. So it does kind of have the best of both worlds. We are not going to get into today the C corporation versus the S corporation and 
which one of those is better because it kind of depends on what you're doing as to whether a corporation is a better thing to use or an LLC is a better thing to use. The school is a corporation. It is run by a board of directors, whereas my brokerage company is an LLC. The good thing about LLCs is they are what we call a pass-through entity, meaning that each one of the owners or members of the LLC is, gets their portion of the income or loss at their own specific tax rate. So if you've got four owners of an LLC, the property is, the money is split in a flow through, and then each person pays taxes on their portion based on their own specific tax rate. Whereas, you know, owner A may be in one tax rate, owner B may be in another, okay? So there are some advantages. If you're interested, we do have a class called, uh, uh, what's it called? Business Entity Formation, where we go into depth on to which one's the best for what you're doing. Cool?